And thank you all for inviting me. Uh, it's a small group, so we can be informal. If you have questions, uh, please jump in. Uh, my task today is to tell you a little bit about our experience in aquaculture. And since you're a relatively new group, I think we'll have a lot to talk about. Aquaculture is one of the great unfilled needs, I believe, in the United States. And I'll, I'll show you why I believe that uh, as we go through this. The slides are really to keep me on track. I have a tendency to wander and, and talk about issues that I like. So, uh, And I did last night throw a few extra slides in, realizing that you've given me a little extra time. And I will talk a little bit about our particular application, uh, because we're hoping to highlight our product as an opportunity for U.S.-based aquaculture. And I hope by the time I'm finished, you'll understand why I believe that. This is the world fisheries both capture, wild caught, and uh, aquaculture. And as you can see, uh, at least in the last five years, and probably for the last 20 years, the world capture fisheries has basically been flat at about 90 million tons. Many of the important species are either overfished or threatened or endangered. Uh, there are serious issues with licensing, uh, with uh, methods of fishing, uh, we're sending larger vessels out with more efficient ways of capturing, some of them perhaps environmentally destructive. Um, it's an opportunity for better regulation and perhaps better management, but it's a fact that for probably 20 years, the world wild caught fisheries or capture fisheries has been flat at 91 tons. On the bottom of that, you can see that on the other hand, aquaculture has been growing at roughly 7 to 8% per year. That's a pretty good annual growth rate. And the reason it's growing is to keep per capita consumption even flat, uh, the fish has to come from somewhere. And aquaculture is effectively meeting that need. There are many types of aquaculture. You have uh, the, you know, the traditional trout raceways. You have the, the net pens and sea cages that are typical of the salmon industry. Um, you have uh, tanks <laughs> either submerged or above ground, uh, typical of tilapia, catfish, and you know, species. So the ability to grow and farm these organisms in a, in a predictable, product, productive, and uh, controlled environment uh, is a new opportunity. And it's being uh, widely adapted around the world. This happens to be a, a picture of our research farm in Panama. Uh, you can see it's, we're growing salmon in the Panamanian Highlands, something that no one thought was possible. And a little later in the talk, would be apparent why we can do that, uh, but we're growing them in land-based contained, if you will, tanks, uh, and they do very, very well. These are some sites from some commercial operations, uh, and as you can see, uh, this sort of land-based contained aquaculture represents an opportunity for a completely controlled environment, predictable production, stocking, uh, as well as a very high quality product. And the ability to, to use these now recirculating aquaculture systems or RAS systems is one of the new emerging industries, both from an engineering standpoint and from a food production standpoint. As Mark Walton told you this morning, the world population is growing. Interestingly enough, some people dispute this. Uh, but these are, are the U.S. Census Bureau. You can also find World Health Organization. You can find UN numbers. There is no question in my mind, barring some cataclysmic event, uh, that the world population will reach 9 billion people, probably in the time of 2030 to 2050. Uh, that's not so far off. In many of these countries where the population is growing, it's not simply a question of increased population, as Mark pointed out. It's also a question of people now entering into the middle class. Because many of these emerging economies are now uh, finding their economic uh, place and, for, for instance, in China. There's a growing middle class, so they're demanding a higher protein, higher quality diet, less carbohydrate based. Um, it's also true in India and some other developing economies. So, where does this food come from? If terrestrial and uh, aquatic resources are limiting, how will we feed these 9 billion people? 1 billion of which, for instance, will be in the World aquaculture production in 2012. The 800-pound gorilla is China. 61% of the total aquaculture product in the world comes from native China. As you can see, there are other uh, countries that have made initiatives, India, uh, Vietnam, uh, and so forth, uh, Indonesia, 
uh, primarily in Southeast Asia and in Asia, uh, with major emphasis in aquaculture. Uh, we are well aware of Norway, we're well aware of Chile, I'll talk about those in a minute, but the majority of the aquaculture today is in the Far East. NOAA, for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, is the responsible body here in the United States, both for wild-caught fisheries and for aquaculture. And the NOAA statistics, uh, American consumption lags behind global consumption significantly. The average American consumes about 15 pounds compared to about 41 pounds on a global basis per capita. In the United States, more than 90% of that was imported, and half of it was produced by aquaculture. But as you'll see, not in the United States. The top 10, shrimp is the leading seafood, most popular seafood in the United States, followed by tuna, not the fresh kind, not the sushi kind, salmon. Salmon, number three, pollock, tilapia, also very popular right now. Pollock is to some extent farmed in the United States, but less than a few percent of the total uh, tilapia produced in the United States is produced uh, in aquaculture. <coughs> This is the, from the USDA Economic Research Service. I try to use either FAO or USDA in all my talks because then people can't question our motives and they can't question the integrity of the numbers. If you don't use these, uh, they're a tremendous resource and, and we basically uh, use all of these for not only our presentations but also uh, any analysis that we might feel we need to do. If you look at the salmon imports, for instance, in 2013, the U.S. imported over $2 billion worth of Atlantic salmon. Atlantic salmon. We're going to make a distinction there. A significant amount of fresh, uh, a fair amount of frozen, and a lot of fillets that were primarily sourced from Chile, the number one importer of Atlantic salmon. Many of you know, but I'm going to say it anyway because it's, it's a common misconception. There really are uh, two major classifications of salmon. There are the Pacific salmon, the five economic species. There are the other salmon, which is the Atlantic salmon. Atlantic salmon is an extensively farmed, in fact, solely farmed species. There are no wild caught fisheries, no captive fisheries, barring maybe a small wild caught fishery off the coast of Iceland. Iceland. But Atlantic salmon is primarily a farmed species. Pacific, on the other hand, about half of them are what's called ranch. They're all alleged to be wild caught, but about half of them are grown in hatcheries, they release the salt, and they catch some percent of them, say, the same as adults a few years later. But the Pacific's in the Atlantic are completely different species, Ocarincus and Salmosella. Uh, the Atlantic salmon are, is going to be a lot of the focus for what I talked to you about aquaculture. It is exclusively far. So where does our, our seafood come from? Chile is a source, a major source of salmon, as you can see, uh, about 40%. Uh, China is the major source of tilapia. India, Thailand, um, Indonesia, uh, Ecuador, major source of shrimp. We import 94% of our seafood. We import from countries that sometimes have had experiences with good safety issues, production <coughs> issues, and many of these countries have products approved or in use that are not approved in the United States. I, I have a few slides here on NOAA. Um, NOAA does a nice job. Uh, there is both <coughs> atmospheric administration as well as the National Marine Fisheries. Uh, they had a new proposed aquaculture plan, fisheries plan, uh, that they're working on as a draft. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the reason I, I show this slide is they talk about marine aqu aquaculture in the United States of a vibrant community. It, that's true in the sense of a vibrant community of researchers because we don't have a vibrant community of producers. Uh, we are the source of most of the technology for all the aquaculture industries around the world, at least the new technology. Uh, we are certainly not practicing that technology and we're not producing those fish in the United States. Uh, they do acknowledge that U.S. marine aquaculture is small. It's, it's less than 1% of the total global production. So there's a huge opportunity. They, they have a draft aquaculture policy that they issued in 2011. I do not believe it's yet been finalized, but if, if you read it, it's very nice. I haven't shown it all, but this is a, 
an example of the first six points. It talks a lot of, about a lot of really good things. Sustainable, we heard about that this morning. Provides jobs, product services, uh, in harmony with healthy, productive, resilient. It says all the right things. Ensure agency aquaculture decisions protect wild species. We can argue with that. Advance scientific knowledge. Make timely and unbiased aquaculture management decisions. Uh, these are all good things. It's what you might expect from uh, national administration uh, that will make all the politically correct statements. Uh, they have yet to put their money where their mouth is. And that's not a criticism. It's, it's a statement of fact. The devil is in the details. $16.4 billion of seafood comes into the United States every year. Why is that? Because we've entrusted the production of our food to countries that have had experiences with food contamination, food poisonings, food safety issues, and unapproved products used in their systems. And people are perfectly comfortable with that because they don't know where the food comes from. And when they do, they're also lobbied by people who say, you don't want this industry on our shores, you don't want it off our coast, you don't want it in the neighborhood. So it's, we've abdicated uh, roughly 15% of the total food imports um, to countries that we, we probably don't hold in very high esteem from the food production standpoint. What are the barriers in the U.S.? Production economics is one. There's a reason it goes to Southeast Asia. Cost of labor, child labor in some of the industries, uh, labor practices that perhaps uh, would not be found in the United States or in Gulf countries. Environmental concerns, salmon fishing and salmon farming was, was forced out of the, the uh, Northeastern Maritimes in the United States about 20 years ago for environmental concerns. Some of them legitimate, some of them not. The activist community has had a huge role in, in the uh, prevention and, and the uh, diminution of aquaculture in the United States. There are certainly regulatory issues, and a sum of all of these is why would people invest in an industry where there are uncertain regulatory timelines, uncertain regulatory outcomes, and certainly a lot of headaches that go along with just trying to accomplish your business or uh, grow your business here in the United States? So there are a lot of impediments. I'm going to talk a little bit now, parochially, about our experience. As, as you know, I represent Aqua Valley. And Aqua Advantage Salmon was thought to be a solution to some of the problems associated with salmon production. I've already told you that the U.S. imports <coughs> over $2 billion worth of black salmon. That's about 270,000 tons in 2013. That's a lot of salmon. It comes from Chile, it comes from Canada, it comes from Norway. Yes? What's the regulatory or inspection of the environment like for having imported? <laughs> Deborah, do you think you know the answer to that? <laughs> high, low, medium, existent at all? I, I think that the well, official in, numbers. In terms are, of product, is it 1% is inspected? It's, it's 1%. And they're supposed to have this HACCP regulation to follow all the regs and yada, yada, yada. Not. <laughs> Less than 1% of that works. It was it's actually physically inspected. And the nature of that inspection is interesting. You, you may read, as we do, uh, the, the uh, reports of batches that are on hold. So primarily olfactory. If it smells bad, you refuse it. And, and they inspect from uh, And what about the inspection of our fish? Well, that's a, little, that's a little different. In fact, in catfish, it's a different inspection. It's, it's USDA versus FDA. Uh, that's a whole other talk and, and a whole other opportunity. Uh, catfish is a, a relatively uh, powerful lobby and a relatively successful industry, albeit a relatively small industry in you know, sort of the, the, the overall footprint of the global aquaculture. But uh, the, the U.S. industry, what there is of it, uh, is more technical. So these are, these are sisters, believe it or not. These fish came from the same spot at the same age. The fish in the foreground is the St. John's River stream, Atlantic salmon, again, distinct from Pacific salmon. And the fish in the background, same age, 
is what we call output advantage. They differ in one gene, about 4,000 base pairs, and four times 10 to the ninth total base pairs. If you press percentages, that's about one ten thousand to one percent. Single gene. That single gene confers what we refer to as the rapid growth phenotype. It means that in the early life stages of the salmon, if the salmon has adequate food, and the temperature is permissive, it will grow. Unlike the unmodified salmon. The unmodified salmon is programmed genetically by photoperiod, by water temperature, and, and by availability uh, of food. So it's programmed to stay in the gravel and grow very slowly in the first two years of life. The output advantage is <coughs> one gene, which is regulated slightly different, produces the same growth hormone that allows growth of the unmodified salmon, but it allows it to grow. So what's the big deal? Why, why do this at all? Well, fish is healthy. Omega-3s are good. There's a lot of evidence nutritionally that uh, both for development, uh, for neonates, uh, for expecting mothers, and for the general population, it's cardio-healthy. Uh, it's good for development. Uh, it's, it's a safe and sustainable product. Many of the world's fisheries are maximally exploited, and I, we didn't talk about this, but Mark alluded to it. Aquaculture must at least triple by 2030. Triple today just to keep per capita consumption at current levels. Not to increase it, but just to meet the need of the, of the additional population. So, where do we get our fish? You don't go out with a line and you don't have to. Um, if we're going to meet that global food security need, we have to be able to produce those fish. The genetics and husbandry practices in the industry are generally primitive. They're basically, for instance, sea bass sea bream in the Mediterranean, major aquaculture effort basically growing wild fish. In some species, like the tuna, they just close the reproductive cycle so they're able to grow them effectively and breed them effectively. So those of you who are in the livestock, poultry, uh, beef, you're, you're in Star Wars in terms of genetics compared to what exists in the aquaculture industry. There is nothing. And there's a huge opportunity. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit. Whatever you might have. <laughs> I can remember sitting in Andy Rohrer's office in, in Georgia, Conyers, Georgia, and it was the late 90s. And this was before we did anything with aquatic animal health in Angus. So we're singing our song to Andy, and all of a sudden his light bulb goes on. Like, you guys are where we were in the early 1900s. <laughs> That's right. You need to get your act together. But the industry hasn't. Undercapitalized lack of enthusiasm, <laughs> growing regulations. And when you did this, I thought, yes, we've got it. I mean, I've raised trout, it takes a long time. You know, so, as a consumer. I'm going to take you with me everywhere I go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, we have technology. We know how to do this. So why don't we? Go back to Mark. Alton's talk, go back to cautionary principle, go back to regulation by referendum, go back to silliness. It's not about understanding people's right to choose or people's health right to opinions. I think Patrick Moynihan uh, from New York said, you're entitled to your opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And in this particular instance, <laughs> this, this application has been beat to death. What are the facts here? This is a major cult cultured species. Salmon is one of the most popular species. It's a very popular product. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. We, we load 747s with salmon pellets in Puerto Monticelli, and we fly them to the New York markets. you have any idea what the carbon footprint of that is? you have any idea what the cost? It adds a dollar and a half per kg for the cost of that salmon. That salmon is probably seven to 10 days old by the time it's fresh in New York, by the time they process it, load it, fly it overnight, and get it to the markets and get it The nutritional benefits are well known. We all acknowledge that the, the captive fisheries are basically stressed, if not exhausted. When's the last time you had a really nice piece of Atlantic cod? I'm 64, soon to be 65, and the last time I had a nice thick cod fillet was when I was about 10, because we overfished the cod fisheries and it basically disappeared. If you go to the Maritimes, you can still get a nice cod fillet, but only the locals get it because of the, the limited fishing. 
This is what we did. We put a single gene, 4,000 base pairs. We put it in. We've been breeding it for more than 22 years. We have 13 generation pedigree on our product. The gene's the same. The gene product is the same. It stayed in the same place, and the phenotype has been the same since 1989. It's been bred by classical genetics. Mendelian genetics, you read, we do a little interesting presentation on how we do that, but it's simple Mendelian genetics. This fish has been around for over now uh, 24 years. So, what does it do? You don't have to be a statistician to see that allowing the fish to grow results. Here we reach 500 grams in something over 200, 220 days. Uh, the unmodified sister, <coughs> the same spawn, takes <coughs> twice as long. That's the origin of the growth place of state. It's a little more complicated than that because you can see the growth rates here are really four to six times the growth rates here. And as you go further out, they, they come together a little bit more. But on average, you could produce a market weight sample about half the time. That's a big deal. What, is, what are the costs associated with producing a market weight sample? You've got to feed it, you've got to maintain it, you've got to protect its environment, you've got to run the lights, you've got to pay the, the workers, you've got to do all the things necessary to grow that fish. Big component is feed. This fish has a feed efficiency 20%, 25% better than the modified. It's not surprising, but it's 20% better, and that's published data. It's not an off-label claim. Published data by independent researchers, 20%. A 5% better nitrogen retention. What's the most expensive component in the diet? The protein nitrogen. What's the biggest hot button in feeding carnivorous fish? Fish meal and fish oil. So, you would think that if I was an environmental group, this is a fish that can be grown in land-based contained aquaculture systems, and I forgot to tell you, conventional fish, because of their slow growth, literally eat up the profits in the tanks. You can't make any money, and you can't produce any product by growing an unmodified salmon in a, a conventional aquaculture system, at least not very much. In fact, this fish in land-based systems outperforms economically the unmodified salmon in sea cages, and that's where you have much lower capital costs and you have much lower production costs. So, you can grow it in land-based systems, you can prevent it from interacting with wild populations, you can insulate it for pathogens, you can have a predictable supply on, on a continuous basis of a, whatever size you want. You can harvest one kilo, two kilos, three kilos, whatever. Uh, it's environmentally sustainable, and you're not flying it halfway around the world. Well, it's not polite. Well, go to the Golden Rice, go to all the other stories that Mark told you this morning. This is a product that's triploid. <coughs> three copies of the chromosome. Triploids don't produce fertile progeny. Our triploid is validated greater than 99.8%. Believe it or not, we can criticize for that. Uh, they're all female, and that's kind of a neat trick. For those of you, you're, this is an aquatic workshop, but we, we produce homozygous neomales, and that's what we care for gene. So we have genetic girls who produce sperm, and we use those to fertilize fish and wild type eggs. So we have 100% female populations. We then render them triploid using a highly validated, consistent. And we have a release assay for triploidy so that every batch of eggs that we would release would be greater than the, the, the release assay is 95%, but we've been averaging 99 point something percent in all the batches that we produce. The claim, this is kind of silly, we had to come up with an efficacy claim because we're being regulated as a drug. So we said, well, how about if we grow to 100 grams faster than uh, the non transgenic comparator? So that's the claim. If you're growing salmon, that's a meaningful claim. If you're a consumer, what does it mean? It means the fish grows faster. Conditions of use. They'll pro they're produced as eggs. They'll be only grown in land-based <coughs> agriculture systems. Why did we go through all these suits? Did we have to? When I joined the company in 2006, the, the fish was uh, basically uh, still a dream. We sat down with FDA and we said, here's, here's what the, the people who oppose us are concerned about. They're concerned about effects on biological diversity, interaction with wild populations, environmental impacts. They're concerned about food safety. We can produce all female populations. We can make them triplet so they produce, they, they can't produce fertile offspring. And we can add to that by saying we'll only grow them in land-based containment systems. We 
because these fish grow rapidly enough to make those systems economically viable. It's a viable alternative. And the FDA said, whoa, gee, we don't know. That seems to answer all the questions. And so we proceeded down that path. The, the salmon itself, after an extensive FDA review in 2010, and this is a public meeting, the FDA concluded, and I've simplified it a little bit, if you want to read the 180-page report, it's on the, on the website. Uh, it's called the FDA Briefing Document for the VMAC meeting in 2010. Whoops. It's an Atlantic salmon. We knew that, but we were pleased to hear them say that. <laughs> it's as safe to consume as any other salmon, and that it represents no significant risk to the environment under conditions of use of the application. In one year later, Food and Water Watch, in a publication that they put out, uh, and they were at the meeting, by the way, uh, said, Aquabonish GE salmon would be raised in farms would likely have many of the same nutritional deficiencies that unaltered farm salmon already have. There's no data to support that. Yes. One of those things that if you say it a hundred times, maybe someone will believe it. Lower levels of omega-3s, basically, oh, and, and, and the contaminants like polychlor polychlorinated biphenyl. Where did that come from? What Mark didn't say downstairs because he was too polite. These groups don't like something. They'll just make stuff up. This is completely factually unbased. There is no substance to any of these problems. They know it. We know it. The consumer does it. The average citizen has no idea. First of all, it's a fish. They buy it in a the store. They think it's been injected with dye because it says color added. Uh, they have no clue. And who, who do they believe? Do they believe scientists? Do they believe people like me? Or do they believe people who are allegedly looking at their interests? This is nonsense. I went, even went to our attorneys. I said, this is slanderous. This is why We must have recourse. You don't have an approved product, so you can't prove damages. So they can say this and prevent us from getting an approval, and we have no legal recourse. Well, yeah, it's not a perfect system. It's good for the lawyers. It's good for the activists. But it doesn't help the sponsors. No wonder people don't want to invest in these sorts of technologies or in innovative new opportunities in food production. There are now 11 different bills that have been introduced in our Congress to block us. This is part of that political agenda that Mark talked about. I won't go through them all. How does this happen? Well, NEPA, passed in 1970 and signed by Richard Nixon, was implemented to protect the environment. That's a good thing. NEPA is the most litigated legislation on the books. I'll talk about an example in Todd's neighborhood. Here it is right here. Uh, Food and Water Watch, the same folks that, that uh, are so friendly with us, uh, filed a suit against NOAA for giving a license to Kona Blue's fish farm in Hawaii. And what was the basis for the suit? That the agency didn't have the authority to issue the permit and that their fishery plan was, or their management plan was inadequate. No matter what any sponsor does, that's a typical, that's the sue and settle approach. It's now become so popular and politically correct among government circles and activist circles. This, this sort of harassment goes on every day, not just with us, but with anyone who's doing anything with these groups of folks. And it's completely arbitrary. And there's no penalty for it. We have a suit pending for us in Canada now because the Canadian uh, Environment Canada gave us an approval to operate as a commercial hatchery in Canada. They after the, the uh, notice was published in the Canadian Gazette, we had a lawsuit. And the lawsuit was that they acted without legal authority. It's nonsense. It takes six, eight months to resolve, use up a lot of resources, wastes a lot of time. Uh, but at the end of the day, we'll, we'll certainly expect a decision stand. But it's, it's harassment. It's, it's interference. It's a lot of things. Uh, not the sort of thing that, that they would like to be known for. Endangered Species Act, another, uh, another weapon that's used uh, by the activists. Uh, again, uh, President Nixon gave us another little question here. Well-intentioned. Endangered Species, protection of endangered species is a good thing. Who can argue with that? Uh, endangered Species Act has also become a weapon for activists. Between NEPA and, EP and ESA, they have an opportunity to attack. We've been attacked by both. Not to be outdone, the senators from Alaska have introduced several bills. This was this is a favorite from Senator Mark Pegasus called Pegasus. It's the, the prevention 
of escapement of genetically altered salmon in the United States Act. What it really says is it's illegal to basically possess, sell, grow, or in any way uh, interact with uh, a specific product, which happens to be off advantage, to ship, transport, offer for sale, sell, or purchase covered finished product containing. To have custody, control, possession. Anyone who knows anything about our laws knows that this violates the Commerce Clause, it's restraint of trade, it's a whole lot of stuff. This actually made it to a Senate committee, never made it out of committee, unfortunately. Did it take a lot of time and effort on our part and a lot of other folks' part? People like uh, the Farm Bureau, people like uh, Bio, people like a lot of other national organizations. To keep this from getting out of committee, absolutely. Did it tie up a lot of resources? Yes. Uh, this is the, the sort of, of harassment that we've had to deal with. The last thing that I'd like to get into is the, the sort of the social and economic <coughs> and political components of the regulatory process. We're a science-based country. We, we allege, we pay lip service to the fact that we make science-based decisions. Our president tells us that quite frequently. Uh, we make science based decisions based on the best available data. But yet, we make social, economic, and political assessments. Just like the Europeans do. This paper came out. Uh, what they were encouraging was uh, that we consider social and economic considerations in the regulatory process. The problem with those, and everyone's entitled to their view, is those paradigms change. What may be socially acceptable today might not be socially acceptable tomorrow. More importantly, who gets to make the assessment? If I get to make the assessment, I'm feeding the world and I'm introducing a new technology that has a sustainable footprint and can grow American aquaculture. If Food and Water Watch is doing the assessment, I'm poisoning the American consumer and threatening the economy of China and God knows what. So they're, they're subjective assessments. And, and that, I think, is a disservice to our, our population. CAST has weighed in on this. This was a paper that appeared in 2011. Their conclusions were an inhibitory effect on commercial investment as a consequence of the political circus that, that this application has generated. We've had letters from groups, and, and this is sort of, this isn't all of the folks that, that have uh, helped us along, uh, but you recognize many of the names. Friends of the Earth, Earth Justice, Greenpeace, Union of Concerned Scientists, Oceana, Ocean Conservancy, Pew Environmental Group. Uh, before taking final action, do an environmental impact study. I, don't, I, I assume all of you know the difference between environmental assessment and environmental impact study. Environmental impact study is like falling down a well with us to rock. There's no end point to it. It takes as long as it takes. And, and that's also, along with ESA and NEPA, a, a frequently used tactic. And it sounds great. Why not just assess the impact? It could take 10 years. It could take 100 years. The good news is we've been able to galvanize support. People like... Uh, Again, the Farm Bureau, uh, a whole lot of, of animal groups. Uh, I don't know if we had NIAA involved, but if we didn't, I hope we have you next time. Uh, but we had 30 uh, agriculture groups basically petition Congress to say, just let the system work. Don't fiddle with it. Don't interfere with it. Let the FDA make a science-based decision. So here we have a, an example, and, and I'm sorry for the digression, but the, the, the product has superior production characteristics. They're all female. It's regulated as a drug, which is a pretty rigorous regulation, more rigorous than any other food that we have. We've published a detailed environmental assessment. Um, we've had 19 years, basically, in regulatory review. Uh, three years from a public meeting where the FDA said that the application was safe, the product was safe and effective. A two-year delay <coughs> publishing the environmental assessment because apparently it got in the way of a presidential election cycle. So they basically stonewalled us for two years. We could not get any updates on the status of our application for more than two years. We went to every agency in Washington, and I knocked on every door, all the way up to the office of the president. We basically said, we got nothing. We'll tell you. John Entine published a story in December of 2012. Within two days, the HHS folks at CBM released the environmental assessment. It wasn't a nice story. It was a story that, frankly, we were surprised at. But basically, the story said it had helped the political for two years. We've invested, or I should say our investors have invested more than $70 million to date. Why did they do that? Because they believe what we're doing is right. They believe what we're doing has value. And the biggest, probably, reason that people oppose us is because we're the first. And the fear among the activist community is that if we're approved, no matter how safe we are, there might be 
get around <coughs> times. That is actually the thing that keeps me going and gets me up in the morning and keeps me going at night. If we are approved, hopefully there will be others. There will be new innovation. There will be new technologies. There will be new opportunities in our life culture. So it's not just about one product, it's not just about one technology. I've told you my story simply so that we can put this in perspective. This is not a hypothetical argument. This is not a gentlemanly intellectual debate. This is a brass knuckles war with people who have no integrity and no principles. We're dealing with NGOs and, and groups that are completely unprincipled, they're putting out lies and misinformation, and they know they're lies and misinformation. And what we as an industry need to do is to stand up and say, wait a minute, there's another side to the story. Stick to the facts. If we lose this battle, we will step back, as Mark said, to the 19th century. If we lose this battle, a lot of people will go blind, will die, and will be hungry in the next 30 years. If we lose this battle, the cost of food in the United States will grow perhaps 200 to 300 percent in the next 20 years. This is not about one product. It's not about feeding you know, salmon canapes to, to BMW and Mercedes driving uh, you know, wealthy people. <coughs> this is about production technology that has value in American agriculture. Our choice is to either demand science-based regulation or accept the dependence on those foreign sources of supply. And we may well have this technology anyway because in, the, in China right now there are 80 pending applications for genetically modified animals. So that's my story, that's our opportunity, and I hope we will have your help going forward to try to make this a reality.